other building. Uh, junk food in the back, you probably know that. I want to talk about universal references in C++ 11. There's going to be some things I'm going to be assuming that you already know, so I hope everything on this slide is familiar to you. Some objects are copyable, some objects are movable, some objects are both of those things. Expressions can be either L values or R values. It is important to know that the function move simply returns that thing as an R value. The only thing move does is cast its argument to an R value. And I'll be using that fact a fair number of times. You need to know the basics of L value references and R value references. I assume you know that one ampersand means L value reference, two ampersands for purposes of this slide means R value reference. There are some binding rules. If you have an L value reference, you can bind an L value to it. You can also bind an R value to it if it's a reference to const. And R value references, you can only bind R values. And although it's not germane to this particular talk, in a couple of the examples, I'm going to be using the syntax for variadic templates. So you don't have to know anything about variadic templates, but you should at least recognize the syntax um, when I show it to you. So that's the plan. So this is the crux of my argument. And this is sort of my level of understanding about R value references based on looking at them for about three years. And it took me a long time to come to this level of understanding. I find it useful. I hope that you do as well. This is the situation. If I have an R value reference, I'm going to see syntactically type ref ref in the program somewhere. It is logical to assume, therefore, that if I see type ref ref in my program somewhere, that implies that I have an R value reference. And that is not true. The problem is I can have type ref ref, and it is not an R value reference. And this leads to enormous amounts of confusion in my experience. So my fundamental thesis that I want to get across to you is that type ref ref does not equal R value reference. As I look out upon you, it occurs to me that you may not have the necessary level of maturity to handle the truth. So this is a lie. It's a really, really useful lie. For most purposes, knowing the truth is less helpful than believing the lie. So this is basically 90 minutes about a lie. Nah, call it 85 because we'll cover the truth at the end and you can make your own decision as to whether it is useful or not. Ampersand ampersand has two different meanings. So if I say I have a function f that takes a widget ref ref, no problem. This is an R value reference. If I declare variable one of type widget ref ref, no problem. This is an R value reference. If I say auto ref ref var2 is var1, this is not an R value reference. If I have a template that takes a standard vector event ref ref, that's an R value reference. If I have a template which takes a T ref ref, this is not an R value reference. So the simple syntactic existence of two ampersands in a row, setting aside its meaning as logical and, does not imply that you have an R value reference. And by the way, I am still lying to you. The lie will continue for quite a while. I'll let you know when we hit the truth. When you see type ref ref, that double ampersand actually means one of two things. It either means what you've probably been taught to date that it means. It means R value reference. R value references, as you know, they only bind R values, and they exist for purposes of facilitating moves. The other possible meaning of ref ref in type ref ref is what I call a universal reference. This 
is new terminology. It is in terminology that, as far as I know, I came up with. I find it to be extremely useful, and I will be trying to convince you during the course of this presentation that it is useful for you as well. A universal reference is either an R-value reference or it is an L-value reference. Syntactically, you write type ref ref. That's what you write. But it actually means either type ref, L-value reference, or it means type ref ref, R-value reference. A universal reference binds L values and R values. It binds const and non-const. It binds everything. It is a universal reference. It can refer to anything, which is not something an L value reference can do and is not something an R value reference can do. As a result, it may facilitate copying, but it may facilitate moving. It can do both of those things. It is more powerful than an R value reference, even though syntactically it looks the same. In order to make things fit on the slides, I'm going to come up with some shorthands. They're fairly straightforward. LREF means L value reference, RREF means R value reference, and UREF means universal reference. So here's the talk in a nutshell. Universal references are possible in four contexts. First, function template parameters. This is a universal reference. They can also occur in auto declarations. This is a universal reference. They can occur in typedef declarations, and they can also occur in decal type expressions. For purposes of this presentation, we're going to cover the templates and auto first. Type defs and decal type will come after that, because they're not quite as straightforward. So this is pretty much everything you need to know. I will elaborate, but nevertheless. If you have a variable or a parameter, and its declared type is trefref, for some deduced type t, you have a universal reference. There are two requirements for being a universal reference. The two requirements are the type has to be trefref. And when I say trefref, nothing else will do. We'll see examples. But that's not enough. In addition, you have to be in a context where the type is going to be deduced. If the type is not being deduced, you do not have a universal reference. Those are the two requirements. Otherwise, it's an R-value reference. Universal references are references. Like all references, they require initializers. You can't just have a reference. It has to be initialized with something. If the initializer for a universal reference is an L-value, the universal reference becomes an L value reference. And if the initializer for the universal reference is an R value, it becomes an R value reference. In some sense, I think of a universal reference like a chrysalis of a butterfly where it's going to become something, but it hasn't become something yet. It ultimately will be an L value reference or an R value reference. And the compiler is going to figure out which one it is. It's clearly determinable during compilation. But when you just see type ref ref, if it's a universal reference, you don't know what it's going to become. So in this case here, I've got a function template f. It takes a universal reference. Notice it has the proper syntax. T ref ref is the type. And because this is a template, type deduction will take place. That satisfies the two requirements for a universal reference. W is a widget. If I call f of w, w is an L value. I am therefore initializing a universal reference with an L value. As a result, the universal reference becomes an L value reference. And this function here is instantiated with f with an L value reference to a widget. 
This is the kind of thing that confuses people almost always when they're first starting out. Notice that the template has two ampersands, but the function generated from it has one ampersand. Somebody reading this as, this is a function which takes an R value reference, would be very surprised to find out that it only takes a and L value reference. In particular, you cannot bind an R value to this function. Yes? Exactly. So, th so the question is, if we actually somehow um, looked at the binary or used type ID, something to print out the actual type of this thing, the type of the function that's instantiated will be f of L value reference to widget. Okay? If I call the same te template f with move of w, remember that move simply takes its argument and turns it into an R value. So this is an R value. I am therefore initializing this universal reference with an R value, and the instantiated function will be f of widget ref ref. The universal reference will become an R value reference. If I call f of widget, here I am default constructing a widget that is an unnamed temporary object. It is an R value. Because it is an R value, this will again instantiate f of widget ref ref because this universal reference is being initialized with an R value and therefore it becomes an R value reference. Now, I said I'm going to talk about templates and auto first. We'll deal with type defs and decal type later. So, visa vector event, and now I say auto ref ref, this is a universal reference. It is being initialized with the literal 10. The literal 10, when it's an integer, is an R value. Therefore, the type of val is int ref ref, because this universal reference being initialized with an R value becomes an R value reference. But if I say auto ref ref, that's a universal reference, element gets v sub 5, it is helpful to recall that the return type of the array bracket operator on a vector, the return type is an L value reference to an int. I am therefore initializing a universal reference with an L value because all L value references are L values. And as a result, the type of element is int ref. It is an L value reference to an int. So these two auto is with universal references. This one becomes an, L, an R value reference. This one becomes an L value reference. And if you're thinking, auto ref ref, what kind of sick mind came up with that? <laughs> well, I don't bolster my case by citing the standard, but nevertheless, the specification for range-based for loops, so for range declaration colon expression statement, this is from, well, I hardly need to remind you this is taken from paragraph 6, section 5, sub point 4. <laughs> Who doesn't know that? <laughs> but what it says is the range-based for, the range-based for, when you write this, the standard says it's equivalent to this. Notice the auto ref ref. This is either an L value reference to the initializer of the range, or it is an R value reference to the initializer of the range, depending on whether the initializer of the range is an L value or an R value. I suspect that the more you play around with auto ref ref, the more uses you will find for it. So that's why I discuss it along with templates. Most people are familiar with templates, fewer people with auto ref ref, but it turns out to be quite useful and is worth knowing how it behaves. I said there are two requirements for something to be a universal reference. One of them is it has to have the right syntactic type. 
T ref ref. The other one is you have to have type deduction. If you do not have type deduction, you do not have a universal reference. So, here's a function f. It takes a widget ref ref. We know what the type here is. It's widget. There's no type deduction going on. As a result, this is an r-value reference. That's a normal run-of-the-mill r-value reference because there's no type deduction. Here's a template. It has the right syntactic form, t ref ref, and because it's a template, we will deduce the type based on the arguments passed in. Because we have type deduction, this is a universal reference. Sometimes people say, well, all right, if you have an r-value reference-like looking thing in a template, then it's a universal reference, but that's not true. Here's a template for gadget. Here's the gadget constructor, gadget one. Gadget one ref ref. Notice the type must be gadget one. There's no type deduction going on here. The fact that it's inside a template is irrelevant. There's no type deduction. This is therefore an R value reference. However, here I am inside a template, which actually is irrelevant, because here I have a templatized member function. And in this case, I have a function taking T2, but T2 is going to be a deduced type. Therefore, this is type deduction. It's got the right re syntactic form, T ref ref, happen to have named it T2, but the syntactic form is correct. This, therefore, is a universal reference. So, R value reference, universal reference, R value reference, universal reference. Yes? So the question is, wh why might someone ever write this? This is how you write all your move functions. This happens to be a non-member function. So for example, if I wanted to say f can only be called with r values, that's how I say it. That's a, that's a way to say you can only call f with r values. We'll talk about overloading a little bit later. If you want to say, I want to treat r values this way, and I want to treat l values this way, you will overload it for either an r value or for an l value, and that would be one of your two overloadings. Yes? OK, so the question is, why are there two different rules? Um, I'm going to defer the answer to that question. It turns out that when you're older and can handle the truth, <laughs> and with this group that could take a while, but when you're older and can handle the truth, you will find out that there's actually only one set of rules for all these things. Okay? But like I said, it turns out that's the truth. And it also turns out, in my experience, the truth is not useful. What I'm trying to show you now is something which I believe is useful. At the end of the talk, you'll have enough information to make your own decision. So there's, um, like I said, R value reference, universal reference, R value reference, universal reference. Just because you have T ref ref in a template, does not mean you have a universal reference. So here's vector from the C++11 standard. Here's pushback. Pushback takes a T ref ref. It's a template. It takes a T ref ref. But if I'm in a vector class, I can't have a vector without knowing what the type is. It has to be a vector of int, or a vector of widget, or a vector of string. It's a vector of something. And whatever that something is was determined when someone created the vector. So somebody said, I have a vector of string. And a vector of string pushback takes a string ref ref. A vector of int pushback takes an int ref ref. There's no type deduction for this type here, because this type t was determined when the person created the vector and specified what t is. This is not a universal reference. This is an r-value reference. So just because it looks like t ref ref doesn't make it a universal reference. You have to ask yourself, do we have type deduction? In this case, we do not. On the other hand, if we contrast that with in place back, also in the vector class, so here's in place back, and in place back says, I will take whatever arguments you choose to pass to me. 
Now, in this case, in placeback has its own template argument, type deduction does exist. And that means that this ref ref is a universal reference because there's type deduction here. Again, we have the proper syntactic form. It's T ref ref. We've changed the name to args, but it's still T ref ref syntactically. So pushback in vector takes a T ref ref, R value reference, no type deduction. In placeback in vector takes a T ref ref, dot, 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 universal reference. Continuing to look at the vector class, what I want you to notice is there's two versions of pushback. So this is a version of pushback that takes an L value reference to const. Here's a version of pushback which takes an R value reference. It is not uncommon to see these pairs of functions. We have overloaded here. This said, this is the pushback if you pass me an L value. This is pushback if you pass me an R value, and they will be implemented differently. In particular, if you call the one taking an L value reference, we're going to have to copy the element into the vector, whereas if we call the one with the R value reference, we will move that into the vector. On the other hand, here's in placeback. It is not overloaded, because in placeback takes everything. This is a universal reference. It will forward everything. What in placeback is going to do is going to take all of its arguments and it's going to just forward them on to some other function, in particular to the constructor for t in this case. If you're in a template, a universal reference is essentially a forwarding reference, and I toyed with the idea of trying to introduce the terminology forwarding reference and decided that one term is plenty. So I, I really want to focus on universal references. If you have a universal reference and you have overloading, you almost always have made a mistake. It almost always makes no sense to overload on a universal reference with anything else. That's because universal references handle everything. What's the point in overloading if you have a function which will literally take anything? Doesn't necessarily make a lot of sense. It takes L values, it takes R values, cons, non cons, volatiles, non volatiles. Well, they're universal references. But maybe you don't believe me. Maybe you think, damn it, it does too make perfect sense to overload. All right, let's see what happens when we do. So here's a class. I tried to give it a usable name. I call it messed up. So here's a function called do work. It takes an L value reference to const. Here's a function called do work. Now, when people do this kind of overloading, almost always what they want to say is, this handles L values and this handles R values. That's almost always what they are thinking. But that's not what this code says. What this code says is, this is a universal reference. It will bind to anything. This function here will take L value references to const, and it'll be a better match than this only for those. So the reality of the situation is that this overload handles const L values only and nothing else, and this handles everything else. So for example, if M is messed up, W is a widget, CW is a const widget, I call m.doWork with W, this is an L value. It calls this template function. I call it with an R value. It calls this function. Now, CW is a const widget and is an L value. So when I call do work with a const widget, it will call this function. If I, do, if I turn CW into an R value, it's back to calling this function. As you can see, this function does not get called for all L values. It only gets called for const L values. This is a better match for everything else. Because remember, this universal reference can become an L value reference. 
It looks like it only binds R values, but that's misleading. That's why I don't want you to call it an R value reference. It's a universal reference. It's both an L value reference and an R value reference. Yes? Okay, so the question is, you get the desired behavior with partial specialization. What would you like to partially specialize? Okay, well, what I will say is, um, remember I said you have to have exactly a particular syntax. It has to be T ref ref. There is no such thing as partial specialization of a universal reference. There's no syntax for it. If you change this syntax to be anything else, it's not going to be a universal reference any longer. So practically speaking, there's no straightforward way to partially specialize for, for example, for L values and R values. This function declaration, this says, I handle everything. That's what this says. And if you don't want to say I handle everything, you do not want to write this function. Or specifically, you don't want to write that template, I should say. Because that's a way of saying I accept everything. And trying to overload on that, as you can see, is unlikely to behave the way that you would like. Herb. I have a question about the question. So sorry for going meta, but partially specialize what? Remember that you can't partially specialize function templates. So you can overload, which is very similar. Maybe that's what's, what, I just want to understand what the question is, because mm -hmm. you can only partially specialize a class template. Is that what you had in mind? Or just create another overload that's, you know, a slightly better, that sort of looks like a partial specialization of a function template, but isn't? Pardon me? Okay. So, um, I mean, the question is, he's, he's not quite sure. In my experience, when, when people talk about partial specialization and the subject happens to be tem template functions, they almost always mean overloading. But, I, you know, obviously by the language, there's no such thing. Yeah? Uh, so okay, so the question is, can you move from a constant object? Um, we have to be, if I have a constant object, I can apply move to it. The result of move will be that exact same expression as an R value, which means I'm now going to have a constant object, but it's now an R value. All right? If we then pass that into a function which expects to do a move, in that function, almost certainly they're going to try to modify that object, because that's how a move is implemented. And at that point, the code will fail to compile. So when you say, can you do a move from a const object, you can apply the function move to it. That will compile. But whatever you pass that to, when it tries to actually modify the object, it will bump up against that const ness, and your code will not compile. OK? So obviously, objects that are designed to be moved from shouldn't be const. And the compiler will, will enforce that level of const correctness. Yeah? Let, let, let's put it this way. If the person who writes this function assumes that it's modifiable, which is certainly what this looks like, and does a move or says it's null or whatever. If the implementation of this function modifies param, then when you call do work, w will be passed in here by reference, and you will modify that object. So if the person writing this code said, this is going to do something involving copying, and this is going to do something involving moving, if that's how the code is written, then yes, when this call goes through, they will call this function, which will modify this object. And this is not a const object, so there will be no violation of const correctness. Followed by much merriment and debugging. OK? It is exactly the same story for non-member function templates. So if I have a non-member template called do work, takes a reference to const, and a non-member do work, which takes a universal reference. And again, I will emphasize, if you see a universal reference that's being used in a context which is overloaded, this is almost always wrong. You'll have the same kind of problems that you have before. This template will only handle L value references to const. Excuse me, const L values. This will handle const L values. This will handle everything else. 
So do work of W, this is an L value, but it will end up calling this template. This is an R value, it will call this template. This is a const L value, it will call this template. And the const R value will again call this template. The important thing to recognize here is with regular R value references, like pushback, it's completely normal to overload on L value reference to const for copying and R value reference for moving. That's the normal thing you do. But you're not dealing with universal references there. With a universal reference, you're handling everything. So you normally do not want to overload. So this is the basic situation in shorthand. If you have an R value reference which you turn into a universal reference, then whereas with R value references you use move, with universal references you want to use forward. So if you declare something which is an R value reference, you almost always want to use move on it. But if you use a universal reference, you almost always want to use forward on it. So, Here's do work, it takes an L value reference to const. So in this particular case, I'm gonna use operations and expressions that just use parameter directly. I know I have a reference to a constant object. I don't need to do anything special to it. If I have do work, which takes an R value reference, notice there's no type deduction going on here. This is not a universal reference, this is an R value reference. Under these conditions, in this function, Every time I refer to param, almost always, I'm going to want to say standard move param. In fact, I strongly encourage you that if you are writing a function which takes an R value reference, unless you have a compelling reason why you don't want to treat it like an R value, get into the habit of just always taking that parameter and applying move to it. You should do this without even thinking about it. And to that end, I must say that I was a little bit surprised in Andre's code that he showed this morning when he basically said, I'm not going to bother to apply move to the Boolean because it's a Boolean, who cares? The code that will be generated by copying a Boolean and moving a Boolean is identical. The object code, you will not be able to tell the difference. The code will run just as fast if you apply move to the Boolean as if you don't apply move to the Boolean or any built-in type or any pointer. It will not run slower. So I encourage you, as I encourage Andre, <laughs> if you are writing a function taking an R value reference, get into the habit of just applying move to everything instead of thinking, well, do I really need it here or do I not need it here? By default, you should use it. And the only time I can think of when you wouldn't is if you actually don't want that thing to be moved, you want it to be copied instead. Just a second. Yes. Okay. So essentially the question is, why? I think that's the essence of the question. An R value reference will bind to R values. Conceptually, R values are objects that are not referenced by anybody else and we can rip their guts out and nobody will care. Does that make sense so far? Okay, the important thing is there are values. By being R values, that's what tells the type system you can take this object's contents away safely. However, anything with a name is an L value. So param is an L value. Its type is R value reference, that's its type. But param itself is an L value. For how many, how many people is this the first time you've heard this? A few. Okay, let me, let, me, let me try to clarify this because to most people, the first time they hear it, they're thinking, whoa, too many cookies right after lunch. <laughs> if I have an integer, just an integer, I can have an L value integer, for example, a named variable, or I can have an R value integer, for example, an integer that is returned from a function. Whether something is an L value or an R value is independent of its type. I can have an int, 
but I can have an L value int, or I can have an R value int. L valueness and R valueness is independent of type. So if you know the type of something, that doesn't tell you whether it's an L value or an R value. I can have a named object of that type, it's gonna be an L value. I can have that returned from a function, typically that'll be an R value. So type, independent of L valueness and R valueness. The type of param is R value reference to widget. That's its type. It's an R value reference to a widget. But because it has a name, because you can take its address, it is an L value, because that's the definition of what it means to be an L value. I haven't quite answered your question yet, but I'm getting there. When this thing was passed in, whatever expression was passed in, we know was an R value. And the way we know that is it could not bind to this parameter otherwise. Only R values bind here. So whatever was passed in was an R value, which means you can move from it safely. But because we've given it a name, in particular param, that turns it into an L value. So if we wish to continue to use the expression, which we know was originally an R value, if we want to use it like an R value, which in particular means to move from it, we have to turn it back into an R value. And that is why you apply move. So fundamentally my advice is, if you get a parameter that you know was an R value expression, and the reason you know is because only those can bind here, and you ever want to use it turn it back into an R value by applying move to it. So the question is, will it compile without the STD move? And the answer is typically yes. Basically, if you don't have the STD move, then this will be treated as an L value. And usually in practice what that means is you will now end up copying it rather than moving it. This, this is, by the way, um, this is why you can write all kinds of really wrong code in your move constructors and in your move operations, because if you don't apply move to the parameter in every case, it'll generate the same code as the copy operations, but silently compile and run. Keeps people like me in business. But to get to the fundamentals here, if you have a function that takes an R value reference parameter, the only things that can bind here are R values, but because you give it a parameter name, it becomes an L value. If this is still confusing, and it probably is to at least some of you, keep going back to the idea that I can have an int that can be an L value or an R value. It's not so confusing for integers. Type is independent of L valueness and R valueness. Anything, anything you can take the address of is an L value. That's one of the definitions of L value. You can certainly take the address of param. It is therefore an L value. But if you want to use it in some way, for example, by ripping its guts out, you need to turn it back into an R value. Does that answer your question? Okay. Just one second. And what this means is, if you see code that takes an R value reference, and you see a use of that parameter without it being wrapped by move, it is highly suspect. I'm not going to say it's wrong. But I am going to say, it, it, it's the, it, it would certainly catch my attention. Herb, did you have a comment? Yeah, I, I find it useful to remember, it's, the L value usually comes to does it have a name. And the reason is just safety. If you have the name of something, and if you implicitly move from it, you have its name. You could use it again on the next line, because it's got a name. So for that do work function, think of the outside and the inside of the function. Outside of the function, something is being passed to it. And the ref ref just means it could be an R value or it could be a temporary or not. But on the inside of the function, because I've given it a name, it's an L value and I could use it multiple times. So if I implicitly moved from it, for example, that would be bad because on the next line I could accidentally use it again and that's why you have to, it's on the inside. For my purposes now, I'm using it. But I happen to know it only bound, like you said, to an R value. So I should put the move, just say move again 
and treat it as such because I know it's a temporary object, so what else is it going to go away? Why don't I steal its guts instead of copy? And finally, it's the same. Even for bools, it's good to do this because if you don't have a move constructor or move assignment operator, copy is a valid implementation of move. It just falls back to copy. And that's why it it's, all comes out in the wash. And I hope that you will join our campaign to identify people with cute accents who do not follow this rule and encourage them to see the folly of their ways. I used folly. Cool. All right. All right. So this is where we stand so far. If I see a function which takes an L value, and I have a parameter, I usually just use the parameter unadorned. I don't need to wrap it in move or forward or anything, I just use the parameter. It's been working great since 1985, continues to work. If I have a function that takes an R value reference, no type deduction, this is not a universal reference, this is an R value reference, because I know I got an R value passed in, inside the body of that function, I'm going to want to wrap that parameter in move by default because that's what turns it back into the R value that it originally was. But if I have a template that takes a universal reference, and I want to point out at this point, you would not expect to see this template in the same code base with these two lines here. Remember, overloading and um, universal references unmixy things. So I just happen to call them all do work, but you would not expect to see all three of these in the same program. This would stand by itself. Just one second. And this is a universal reference. Now, remember, a universal reference might be an L value reference, but it might be an R value reference. We don't know what it is. We will only be able to determine that when we see how this is initialized. And of course, this will be initialized every time it's called, possibly in different ways at different call sites. So this parameter here, we do not want to apply move to it because that would unconditionally turn it into an R value, which is not what we want. What we want to say is, if whatever was passed in here was an L value, transport it to wherever I want to use it as an L value. But if whatever was passed in here was an R value, turn it back into an R value so people can continue to use move semantics on it. And the way we say that is forward. So if you write a function that takes a universal reference, what you expect is that that parameter, every time it's used, will be up, um, wrapped in standard forward. This is, by the way, Another reason why it's really important to distinguish between do I have an R value reference or do I have an R a universal reference? R value reference, wrap uses in move. Universal reference, wrap uses in forward. If you do not get it right, it is reasonably likely that your program will compile but not behave the way you want. And not behave the way you want could simply mean it doesn't run with the efficiency that you expect, in particular because things that normally would be moves are silently becoming copies. Doesn't mean you won't necessarily get the right answer, you just may have to wait longer for the answer or use more resources to get it. Um, just, there was a question, yes. Okay, so if I generalize a little bit, it's sort of under what condition does it make sense to use R value references given that they turn into L value references so readily? Almost always it's because what you're trying to do, let's go back to vector. Uh, here's vector. Almost always what you're saying is, for example, consider pushback. If I say to pushback, I want to push back a widget. If it's an L value widget, I have to copy the widget into the container. But if it's an R value widget, I can simply move it into the container. So almost always, the reason you are declaring an interface to take an R value, almost always, it's because it is one of two overloads that takes L values or R values, and you can get more efficiency by doing a move instead of a copy. Okay, 
That is certainly the most common case where you're going to do it is, is on those kind of boundary functions. The problem is that, in, for example, inside pushback, now, we don't have the implementation here, but let's suppose pushback calls a function which calls a function which calls a function which ultimately does the work. You're going to need to transfer it each one of those, those places. So if pushback ends up calling, you know, pushback colon colon or, you know, pushback impl, then I'm going to have to wrap x in move so that it shows up as an r value in pushback impl. Does that help a little bit? The motivation is that, um, if I have bothered to overload a function on L value or R value, it's because I believe I can get some kind of noteworthy performance improvement. And so this is the interface to the users, to, to client code. But the actual code that does the, the construction of the object in the vector may be several hops down. And what I need to do is preserve the R valueness across all those hops until I finally get to the function that's going to do the work. So that would be the motivation for, for doing that. But if you don't apply, ah, here we go. <laughs> if you don't apply move to the parameter at every step as you call some other function, you lose the fact that it was originally an R value. Does that help a little bit? Okay, yeah. Bingo, bingo, exactly. So, so going back to, to the pushback example, It, let's suppose that pushback calls pushback impl to do some work. If when pushback calls pushback impl, it just passed x here. x is an L value, and that would call the pushback impl overload that takes an L value and it would do a copy. But if, I, if pushback calls pushback impl and wraps x in standard move, it will then call the pushback impl overload taking an R value, and then it can do a move. Okay, so, the, so the, the question is, is there any easy way for me to find out that I'm actually going down the move path as opposed to down the copy path without injecting code in, into my functions? Um, as far as I know, the answer is, there's no simple way. The answer is no. But let me generalize your question a little bit, because what your question really boils down to is, if I have a set of overloaded functions and I call some function with that name, how can I verify that the correct overload is being called? And I don't know of any easy way to do that without, again, injecting code into the various functions to find out which one got called. This is nothing but overload resolution. There's nothing special about movement going on here. It's just the overloading resolution rules distinguish L values from R values. Okay? All right, so we are, we are here, and it is everyone's favorite time of day. It's right after lunch. It's a dark, windowless room. I am talking about pairs of ampersands at length. We are going to take a five-minute break for the sole purpose of letting you get up, get as much caffeine as can be absorbed in five minutes, and sit back down. So I will start, I will start again in five minutes. The fundamental point that I wanted to make is that if you just have an L value reference to const, you don't need to do anything to the parameter, typically. If you have an R value reference parameter, you typically are always going to want to wrap it in move. And if you have a universal reference parameter, you typically are going to want to wrap it in forward. But of course, this still requires that you be able to identify that this is an R value reference and this is a universal reference. And so as I've said, overloading on an R value reference and an L value reference is typically OK. Overloading on a universal reference is typically not OK. Yes? So, so the question is, is OK, so, so the question is, is there a reason not to call forward always? I do not know of any such reason, but I've learned that it's a big, complicated world, and somebody out there might come up with a reason. So it, it would be, in the same way that it would be suspicious to me not to use move, it would be suspicious to me not to see forward. But you know, so, so fundamentally, I agree with you. Yeah. OK, so, so, so what's your question? Why not use standard forward here? OK. Um, I'd have to sit down and think about whether you're going to get the same result, but I'm not going to think about that now because I don't care. <laughs> 
Because, no, because, because, because this is idiomatic on our value references. Because this is idiomatic on our value references. This, when you're reading the code, this says, I want to move from this thing. And somebody reading the code needs to know that. This says, I don't know whether I have an L value or an R value, but I want to preserve whatever it is. So th they make different statements. Um, and I'd have to sit back and think about whether they would actually do something different. But, but even if they do the same thing, I wouldn't care. Thank you. So um, forward require, well, actually, in this case, you know the type. You could do forward of widget. Again, again I, 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 I am not going to silly my mind with this idea. <laughs> it makes me so uncomfortable, I feel compelled to use my laser. All right. When you're trying to figure out whether you can overload or not, I encourage you to think back on pushback versus in place back. Pushback, we overload because we know exactly what the type is. It looks like we don't know what the type is, but because this is a vector of t, we do know what t is. There's no type deduction going on here. Therefore, we know this is an L value, we know this is an R value. But with in place back, we don't know whether we passed whether we received L values or R values. It could be either one or a combination of the two, as it turns out. That's why in placeback is not overloaded. Yes? OK, so the question is, um, I, I need to know what kind of guarantees I have if I call some function, let's say, that, that takes universal references. Um, there's a couple of things. One of them is, if the variable that you pass itself, if it's const, that will automatically be deduced as part of template argument deduction, so it will continue to be const in, in the parameter. Now, if I have a function which is not going to modify anything, it's truly not going to modify things, there is no reason to use a universal reference. I can just declare everything by L value reference to const, just like we did in C++ 98. So the only reason you would have a function like this would be because I either want to copy or I want to move if the move is more efficient, and the moves will only occur on R values, which by definition won't be used again. All right? Um, all righty, so R value, um, R value reference, universal reference, great. I told you that there are two requirements. One of them is type deduction. One of them is that the syntax has to be t ref ref. This is, syntax is something which people often take for granted. So this is a universal reference because it is t ref ref. This is not. This is not t ref ref. This is const t ref ref, which, trust me, from the standards point of view, is totally different. This is an R value reference. I have a function f takes a vector of t ref ref. Notice the t. This means we are doing type deduction. But this is not t ref ref. This is an r value reference. If you add const, if you add volatile, if you add any other, if you add a star to make it a pointer, you do not have a universal reference. Full stop. Similarly. I say auto ref ref v1 is w. This is an L value. Therefore, v1 is an L value reference because the universal reference becomes an L value reference. If I say I'm cool, const auto ref ref, that's an R value reference. It is not a universal reference any longer because that pesky const does not have the right syntactic form. In this particular case, you are attempting to initialize an R-value reference with an L-value, which is why the code will not compile. If you want to know how much creative room for expression you have, this is how much creative room for expression you have. OK, you get the name, the parameter, whatever you want, and you can put white space. Param type ref ref, that works. Want to be a rebel? Param type space ref ref, have a field day. <laughs> it still works. <laughs>
auto space ref rep, I did it my way, that's fine. But there must be one token here followed by arbitrary white space and ref ref. Otherwise, it's not a universal reference and you still have to have type deduction for it to work. Yes? Can you have spaces between the ampersands? Would you like it to compile? <laughs> if you put spaces between the ampersands, then it's going to be interpreted as, um, as um, sorry, um, bitwise, amp bitwise and followed by bitwise and, and it won't compile. So the ampersand ampersand is a single lexical token. So that, that's how much room you have for creativity and flexibility. I think we need more gratuitous animal photos. This is the Australian brush turkey. I chose it because the gender of the offspring are somewhat determined by the nest temperature. And what that means is if you see an egg from this bird, you don't know whether it's going to be a male or a female. It sort of, sort of depends on the nest temperature, which eh, reminded me in some sense of universal references. <laughs> you look much more mature than you used to be. You are ready for the truth. Uh, the truth is that declaring references to references is illegal. So if I say widget ref space ref r w s w, uh, that won't compile. Easy enough to remember. But references to references arise during type deduction and evaluation. So you can't do it. Your compiler is not so inhibited. As a result, there are special rules. If you have a function template that takes a universal reference, you get special kinds of type deduction. So, if I have a template that takes a universal reference, then if you pass in an L value, then the type T that is determined will be T ref. As we like to say, T is T ref. And if you pass in an R value argument, you might think, okay, if it's an R value, it would be T ref ref. No. Then T is just T. And I'm sorry to break this to you, but you actually do encounter serious developers who are having conversations built around, well, okay, but what if T is T? But T could be T ref. Yes, but what if T ref is really T? This is meaningful. <laughs> so, W um, is a widget. It's an L value because you can take its address. I call F of W. Now, the type of W is widget. That's its type. It's a widget. The type that will be deduced is widget ref. That is the type that will be deduced for t, because it is an L value. Special rule only applies to universal references. If I call f on standard move of w, now remember, all move does is turn something into an R value. That's all it does. So the type of this expression is still widget, except now it's an R value. The type that will be determined, excuse me, deduced is widget. So T in this case will be widget. So with an L value, we add an ampersand. With an R value, we do not add an ampersand. As we like to say, T is T ref, T is T. Special rule, yeah. Okay, so the question is, are there any restrictions on what we can do with W after you've invoked standard move on it? The answer is there are zero restrictions. This is still a local object. Its lifetime continues to go until the end of the scope in which it's declared. And after this, you can invoke member functions. You can do whatever else you want on it as far as the language is concerned. There are some types in the standard library which will say, if you have moved from this type, further uses have undefined behavior or whatever. But the compiler itself, all it knows is that widget was a W. It's, excuse me, W is a widget. It's still a widget down here. So all the code making, whatever calls you want, will continue to compile, because it still exists. OK, so here's our same template. It takes a tref ref, a universal reference. If I now call it with f of w, because this is an L value, the type 
t that will be deduced is widget ref. And what that means is I instantiate f of widget ref, and now I take widget ref and just substitute it in for t, because that's the type that was deduced. Widget ref, ref ref, reference to reference. You can't write this code, but the compiler internally can generate it. In fact, this had a name in C++ 98. It was known as the reference to reference problem. It's not a problem anymore. It's an opportunity. Did you have a question? Hold on a second. We're not done yet. Hold on a second. We're not done yet. Because there are four possible combinations of L value reference and R value reference, there are what are known as reference collapsing rules. Reference collapsing rules state that if during analysis of the types in a C11 program, you end up with a reference to reference, the references are collapsed as follows. An L value reference and anything becomes an L value reference. And an R value reference to an R value reference becomes an R value reference. So in other words, R value reference to R value reference always yields an R value reference. And an L value reference to anything yields an L value reference. Um, Stefan Lavov at uh, Microsoft says L value references are infectious. As a set of reference collapsing rules. So now you're old enough to know the truth. Type ref ref really does mean R value reference. It turns out it really, it, it, they really are R value references. But they occur in reference collapsing contexts such that they ultimately become L value references under some conditions. So this really is an R value reference to T. But when I pass in f of w, this ends up with an r value reference to an l value reference, which after reference collapsing is an l value reference to widget. And similarly, if I say f of standard move of w, this is an r value reference, which means t just turns out to be widget, so we end up with f of widget ref ref. And somebody asked earlier, why do we have these two different sets of rules? And now you know we only have one set of rules, but the set of rules is based on reference collapsing. OK, so the, the, the question essentially is, why is there this restriction that you only get this behavior on the very specific syntactic form t ref ref? Why can't you put a const in front of everything else? The answer is, when the people on the standardization committee were working on this, they were trying to solve two very specific problems. One of the problems they were trying to solve was move semantics. They knew basically what they wanted. They needed a syntax that would let them do that. The other problem they wanted to solve was um, perfect forwarding. Those were the two problems that they wanted to solve. And as a result, they came up with rules that solve exactly those two problems. There's no generally um, applicable universal language theory. They said, if we have these exact rules, we will get what we want. And one of those exact rules was it has to be exactly t ref ref. It, it is no more inspired than that. It is a solution to two very specific problems. Perfect forwarding means that if you have a universal reference and you wish to forward it to some other function as either an L value, if it was originally an L value, or an R value, if it was originally an R value, and standard forward will let you do it, that's what perfect forwarding is. So perfect forwarding is a way to recover from an L value, because all parameters are L values, whether it was originally an R value. That's perfect forwarding. And the rules in the standard are very carefully crafted to solve those two problems and nothing else. I said at the beginning of the talk there are four reference there are four um, contexts in which we can have universal references. It should not surprise you that there are four reference collapsing contexts. So auto, oops, auto is the second one. Auto is the second one. Auto uses 
template type deduction rules plus a tiny bit more, but for purposes of discussion here, the rules for type deduction for auto are exactly the same as the rules for type deduction for templates. So in this case here, this is the same as having a template that takes a trefref parameter, which is initialized with an L value. So if this were a template taking a trefref parameter that was initialized with an L value, we now understand that after reference collapsing is taken care of, we would end up with an L value reference. As a result, V1 is an L value reference because that's what would happen in a template. Similarly, if we had a, a, a template which took a trefref parameter and it was initialized with move of W, this is an R value, which means this would become an R value reference and V2 would therefore be an R value reference, which is what is shown over here. So if you know how templates behave, you also know how auto behaves. That is not an accident. Yes? Okay, so um, the, the question, there's sort of two questions here. One of the questions is, if you did this with auto, doesn't this imply you'd have to use STD forward? Remember that what you're doing here is you are declaring a reference to some existing object. All you're doing is creating a reference. Th this says V2 is a reference to whatever is over here. I'm not copying anything. I'm not moving anything. I'm not doing anything. I'm simply creating a reference and binding it to something. So I don't need to use forward because I'm not going to be copying it. I'm not going to be moving it. All I want to do is say, here's an object. I want to refer to it. So there's no need to use forward. Forward preserves L valueness or R valueness. And in this case here, I'm just going to bind a reference to it. Now, the reference itself, because it has a name, the reference itself is an L value. But, that, but does that make sense why you don't need to use forward? Because you're not copying or, or moving anything. You're just binding a reference. OK? Um, having said that, the most common scenario where you're going to want to use auto ref ref is going to be inside of a template where you don't know what the type is in the first place. Think about if you're um, um, think about if you are inside a template function like an STL algorithm that takes two iterators, and you don't know what they're, they're all you know is that they're iterators. You don't know what they iterate over. And what I want to say is I want to dereference the iterator and store a reference to whatever that iterator pointed to. So the question you have to ask yourself is, okay, what is the type of star iterator? If I dereference the iterator, what is the type of that? Now, there is a way to find out using type traits, but it's about this long. If all you want to do is have a reference to that first thing, whatever it is, it'd be much easier to just say auto ref ref equals star p. Does that help a little bit? Um, you can use decal type in that case, but let me hold off on that. Um, I have a few words to say about decal type coming up. Decal type is not my favorite language feature. It, decal type is useful. Everything in the language is useful. Just not always for good. Yes. Okay, so the question is, um, let's suppose I had the proper syntactic form, t ref ref, and I passed in something which happened to be, let's say, const. Under those conditions, the reference collapsing rules are exactly the same. So I'll either end up with an R value reference to const or an L value reference to const. So the reference collapsing rules are independent of whether it's const or volatile, or both. OK. Um, I wish I had a whiteboard. You only get these special reference collapsing types of rules if you have a universal reference. And you only get a universal reference if it's declared as t ref ref. None of this stuff applies if you didn't declare it as type t ref ref or auto ref ref. The, the, the reference collapsing rules only occur in four possible situations. Templates where you're doing type deduction, auto where you're doing type deduction, type defs, which I'll show you in a moment, and decal type, which I'll show you in a moment. Those are the only four. So if you have something um, where you're not doing any kind of type deduction, it won't work for templates and it won't work for auto. And it has to be a deduced T. Just the T is not enough. It has to be deduced type. 
So here's an example using type defs. This is the third context. So here I've got a, a um, template widget, and notice that what I say is, okay, tref is an L value reference type. This is a type def here. And now I say, I want to have a widget of int ref. Well, that means that t is int ref. That means that here I have an L value reference to an L value reference, which, after reference collapsing, turns into what we pretty much would expect it to be in this case, because it is an int ref I'm passing in. This turns into just an L value reference to an int. Just another case where um, reference collapsing applies. If I have a type def that says, okay, widget ref ref is an R value reference to, to a widget. This is an R value reference to a widget. That's what, trust me, there's no type deduction going on here. You can all relax. It's just an R value reference. Sometimes an R value reference is just an R value reference. But now I say, because this is the type name, now I say R value reference to widget, and now I have another reference. Because I can. <laughs> Obviously, the code could be quite widely spaced apart. I now have an L value reference to an R value reference, which after reference collapsing turns into just widget ref. Yes? If you try to write a reference to a reference syntactically, it won't, it won't compile. But in this case, you're just writing a reference to this thing, and this thing itself has some references inside of it. So when it expands the type def, it's getting the reference to a reference. You can sort of argue it either way, but the point is, you as a human can't ever put a reference to a reference. That won't compile. But you can go intermediate through a type def if you want to. Don't know why you'd want to, but you can. Um, the situations that I'm showing are really artificial, on, so they'll fit on one slide, which has, what, 15 lines or something like that. All these situations arise when people are trying to write really um, useful libraries in template code, where in many cases you just don't know what the types are. So it'd be, you know, it's not unreasonable to have, for example, a template class which has a type def inside. And then you can get a reference to reference under certain conditions. Yeah. Okay, so the question is, um, does it also apply to um, whatever, those, whatever, whatever the using things are called? As far as I know, it does not. It only applies to type defs, as far as I know. There's a list of which ones apply. I'll, I'll look it up. You are making the conclusion that because two things are the same, they should be treated the same by the standard. <laughs> this is a very slippery slope. I'll look it up. No, it's, it's an excellent question. I'll look it up. It is my recollection that the part of the standard which talks about reference collapsing says in the following four cases. But that doesn't mean that it doesn't someplace else say, whenever we talk about this, we also mean that. So I'll have to, talk and I'll have to find out what the story is there. Okay, we're running low on time. There's a couple more things I wanted to say, so you can run through the examples here. I was afraid this slide was coming up. Okay. This is the last little fun bit. In template and auto type deduction, references become non-references before L value and R value analysis is applied. So if the type is a reference, you strip off the references, and then if it's an L value, you add the reference back on. So let me give you an example. Here's a universal reference. I've got a widget. Now, LRW is an L value reference to a widget. It refers to W. RRW is an R value reference to a widget. It applies to uh, an R value version of W. Now, the type of LRW is L value reference to widget. The type of R value reference of RRW is widget ref ref. So down to here, everything's pretty straightforward. Now, I'm actually going to show you the last line first, because things make a little bit more sense, I think, if you start on the bottom. So I now say I want to call f on standard move of rrw. Now, rrw is 
an R value reference, and this just turns it into an R value. Excuse me, this, the move turns it into an R value. So I'm calling f, and the type that I'm passing in, the type I'm passing in is R value reference to widget. Which means we would expect this type t to be deduced in this case as R value reference to widget. But it's not. The type that's deduced is just widget. And the reason it, that's the case is because the type of this expression is R value reference to widget, but because we are now going to do type deduction on it, we strip off the R value reference part. We get rid of the references. It's now treated as a non-reference. And that means that T is just widget. Now, the parameter is then a widget ref ref. So the parameter type is widget ref ref. So this is an example where you can see that the type that is deduced by template type deduction strips off the references on the type and then can apply them back again later if it's an L value. Now in this case it's an R value. In this case here, the type of LRW is widget ref. We strip off the reference, but because it's an L value, we turn, it, we turn right around and add it back in again. So what's instantiated is f of widget ref of widget ref. For what it's worth, this one here, the type of RRW is widget ref ref. We strip off the ref ref, just giving us widget, except RRW is an L value. So we add one ampersand back on. And that gives us f of widget ref. Most people are never going to have to worry about this. This is why I happen to think that the truth is nowhere near as useful as the lie. Now, if you are writing templates and you are doing things like declaring um, local variables of type T, you care a lot about what the type that's deduced here is. And if you're writing compilers, you care. One more rule to remember. Last thing I want to talk about is decal type. Things start off nicely enough. Decal type of an expression yields either a T ref or a T, and reference collapsing applies. We've been down this road before. Sounds like templates in auto. Isn't. Because the type evaluation rules are different. You can't possibly expect to have type deduction performed the same way everywhere in the language. What are you thinking? Decal type of an ID, in other words, a, a variable name, an identifier. Decal type of an ID is the declared type of that identifier. Decal type of an L value expression that is not an ID. you'll get an L value reference. And decal type of an R value expression that is not an ID, you will get a non-reference, just T. And perhaps the most famous example of how this differs is if I say decal type of W, well W is an ID. So decal type of W is just widget, which means this becomes widget ref ref. So the type is widget ref ref. But decal type of parenthesis W parenthesis, this is not an ID. This is a parenthesized expression. Totally different. <laughs> From a compiler's point of view, it's a totally different part of the parse tree. What are you thinking? This is not an ID, but it is an L value. And because it is an L value, we go up here to this rule here, it says, okay, this is going to be an L value reference. 
So this entire thing becomes an L value reference, which is followed by an R value reference, and now, duh, we do reference collapsing, which takes the R value reference and the L value reference collapse, and we get a single uh, L value reference, and the result is widget reference. That should be clear. <laughs> there are reasons why decal type is the way that it is, but they're not terribly important right now. Okay, I'm running a little bit over time, so I'm, no, no more questions right now. I just want to finish this. I'm almost done. Um, this is what I believe. I believe that the truth is important, but the lie is useful. So this is what I, I think you should do. I think you should distinguish universal references from R value references because the first thing is I find that it vastly increases code comprehension. If you read type refref as an R value reference, you are going to misread enormous amounts of code, especially in header files. Because you're going to see all these templates that are going to take T ref ref, and you're going to say, oh, it only binds to R values, and you are going to be mistaken. I find that it also really helps communication among developers. If you say, well, I'm going to use an R value reference, that's not the same thing to me as saying I'm going to use a universal reference, which could be an L value reference. There's inherent ambiguity in talking about both things that can be L value references and things that can be R value references as R value references. They're not the same thing conceptually. So my feeling is you should say and write R value reference only when it really has to be an R value reference and it cannot resolve into an L value reference. So that is a universal reference. It is not an R value reference. That is a universal reference, not an R value reference. This is a universal reference, not an R value reference. This is a universal reference, not an R value reference. Clearly, we can figure out in every one of these cases whether it is an L value or an R value reference by applying the appropriate rules. We've seen all of them now. And compilers do that every time they compile. But when somebody's just scanning the code, I think it's um, harmful to say, oh, this is an R value, because it's not, practically speaking. It behaves like an L value or an R value. Similarly for this, this, and this. So the summary of my perspective on things is first, type ref ref does not imply R value referenced. Technically, yes. Practically on a day-to-day -day basis, I think no. I think that the type ref ref syntax plus type deduction gives what I call a universal reference, and I encourage you to use that terminology. Whether a universal reference becomes an L-value reference or an R-value reference depends on the initializer. If you see T ref ref in a template, that doesn't necessarily mean it's a universal reference, because in some cases, T ref ref has no type deduction. We saw pushback as an example of that. Overloading with universal references is almost always wrong. And the underlying language foundation for this business is type deduction and reference collapsing. And it applies to function templates, auto, type def, and decal type. And I'll look up to find out whether using is in that umbrella as well. And if you want some more information about this, I'm actually, I have a draft of a paper that I thought would be two or three pages. And by the time it hit 11 pages, I decided to wait until I'd given the presentation here to see how well it went. That's coming out. Um, Andrew Koenig had an article called A Note About Decal Type, which gives some motivation there. And there's a post by Howard Hinnant in Stack Overflow, which I did spell correctly this, this time, um, actually motivating why is it that this token has two different meanings. And it boils down to, we didn't want to confuse things by adding new tokens. So you can thank the unbelievable clarity of the standard to this decision. So that's what I have to say. We're over time. I apologize for that. Please fill out your evaluations, and we'll take a break. <laughs>